Welcome. I am SNJKV, your personal financial planner. In this presentation, we shall understand the significance and the scope of financial planning, or personal financial management. I have recorded this video on the 1st of September in the year 2020. Yet, if you are watching or listening to this at a later date, even many years in the future, understand that the fundamentals, the idea of planning, and the need to plan do not change with time. So, whenever you are listening to this, this video is going to be largely relevant. Let us delve into the world of financial planning. So, what is financial planning? From my learning and experience as a professional, I define it thus. Financial planning means evaluation of personal financial position of an individual or a family, identifying financial needs and choosing financial goals, and apportioning current and future assets, cash flows and time in the most rational manner to make the apportioned resources work best, and help seamlessly realize the prioritized needs and goals when they are due. Let us break this down and understand it better. The first thing the definition says is, evaluation of personal financial position. That means, one must understand how one is faring financially, be it a lone individual or a family. To simplify further, it means, knowing one's various sources of incomes, recurring and non-recurring or random expenses, and listing one's asset and liabilities etc. This helps in knowing if one has a surplus of cash flow, or if one is overspending. Listing of assets and liabilities give a picture of current net worth. That is, has one more assets than their loans and liabilities, or is it vice versa? This is very essential in the planning process. In fact, every step, whether small or big, is important in financial planning. So, step one is to evaluate the personal financial position like this. Then, the definition says, identifying financial needs and choosing financial goals. Every person or a family has various needs and aspirations or wishes in life. Meeting those needs and realizing the aspirations generally costs money. Without proper planning and foresight, one may find it difficult or even impossible to achieve those goals and needs, whenever they may be due. So, in financial planning, after evaluating the present financial position, all foreseeable needs and goals are identified carefully. At this point, I want you to pay attention to the last few words of the definition where it says, realize the prioritized needs and goals. The important word here is, prioritize. Once all foreseeable financial needs and desired financial goals are identified, one must prioritize them thoughtfully. If you sit with a financial planner to get help with your personal finances, you will, at a later stage in the process understand why prioritization of needs and goals is important. For now, simply remember that a financial plan prepared without prioritization of needs and goals can force an individual or a family and the professional to work the entire financial plan again which is a very tedious process, and it can result in the planner charging an extra fee for the extra time spent that could have been avoided. So, step two in the process as per the definition is to identify the needs and goals. And, step three is to prioritize them. The definition then says, apportioning current and future assets, cash flows, and time in the most rational manner to make the apportioned resources work best. If one has already evaluated one's personal financial position as said at the starting of the definition, one may have already a list of various income sources and assets. One may also have a list of loans and liabilities that have to be paid off sooner or later. It is natural that sometimes, people mark certain investments and assets to various needs and goals. For example, a residential plot or a piece of land may be marked for pre-closing a housing loan, or an insurance plan may be linked to wealth creation in the long term, without any specific time horizon etc. Now that you have understood the definition, let us take a quick look at it again. Financial planning means evaluation of personal financial position of an individual or a family, identifying financial needs and choosing financial goals, and apportioning current and future assets, cash flows and time in the most rational manner to make the apportioned resources work best, and help seamlessly realize the prioritized needs and goals when they are due. I suppose you have now got at least some basic idea as to what financial planning might be. But, do not hurry. There is more to understand about the idea before you can take an informed decision. Who is a financial planner? A financial planner is a professional who has relevant education and experience, and follows a systematic process to help an individual, or a family achieve their financial needs and goals. 
It is not just any process he or she desires, but an established and universally accepted standard. Preferably and desirably, a financial planner is a CFP, that is, a certified financial planner, certified by the Financial Planning Standards Board FPSB, and holds a valid membership issued by the organization to use the CFP mark. It is not uncommon for other categories of advisors and some sales professionals working in the banking, financial services, and insurance domains, to contest in a defensive tone, whenever I, or some qualified CFP says that the term financial planner is synonymous with CFP. They argue that they also do financial planning for their clients. In fact, some of my former colleagues in the broking firms where I worked in the past used to often say, I do oral financial planning for my clients, or, I do financial planning for my clients, it is only that I do not have a certificate and so on. While I appreciate their inclination to provide comprehensive advice to their clients, or their enthusiasm in the financial planning process, I do question the practice. Perhaps those advisors or professionals truly provide holistic advice to their clients. But, what standards do they follow? Who are they governed or supervised by, as regards the financial planning they say they do for their clients? Who are they answerable to if their advice is not suitable to their clients and the clients suffer financially and also otherwise, because of the unqualified advice rendered and availed? While the desire to deliver comprehensive advice is admirable and appreciable, every professional must follow certain standards. Do we accept if some random person researches symptoms for various drugs on the internet, and with general knowledge obtained therefrom, opens a clinic and starts administering medical care, or prescribes medicines to the visiting patients for a fee? Can we appreciate some previously lay person, who buys and studies law books leisurely, opens an office, and starts advising clients on legal issues for a fee? Who is a better person to design a building or a construction? A mason? Or, an engineer or an architect? Who do you prefer? To be certified as a financial planner, to become a CFP, an individual must comply with four aspects of the certification process namely, education, experience, examination, and ethics. In the first step, the candidate desirous of becoming a CFP must study rigorously, and complete all educational courses covering the content outlined in Financial Planning Education Framework Localized for a Territory, by FPSB. On one side, the study ranges from a variety of laws governing a diverse list of topics such as labor laws, securities laws, public liability, employee benefits, ombudsman, investments, insurance, direct and indirect taxes, inheritance and succession, etc., to various regulatory bodies and their functioning, corporate affairs, policies, and procedures. On the other hand, the candidate must show command on various financial formulas, analytical methods to evaluate financial products and their suitability to the financial needs and goals of clients, portfolio management, financial risk and insurance management and so on. Such an extensive study makes a CFP widely knowledgeable, and superior to other types of advisors in the field of financial advisory. Experience is one of the four criteria, verified before a candidate is conferred CFP certification. The experience criterion is considered a necessity for the candidate to apply his or her financial planning knowledge and skills in one or more of the competency profiles outlined under the financial planning curriculum framework. It is important that a candidate demonstrate his or her capability by way of an acquired work experience that involves the development of a financial plan. The candidate is then tested for his versatile advisory skills and his or her ability to apply the theory and practice to varieties of financial situations. Upon successfully passing all examinations, and holding the minimum required professional or working experience in the financial services industry, the candidate is awarded the CFP certification and allowed to use the CFP mark. Before awarding the membership finally, the candidate must agree to abide by the professional code of ethics established by FPSB. FPSB has incorporated ethical behavior and judgment, and compliance with ethical standards, into the global standards for CFP certification. FPSB ethical principles are statements expressing in general terms the ethical standards that financial planning professionals should adhere to, in their professional activities. These principles reflect financial planning professionals' recognition of their responsibilities to the public, clients, colleagues and employers. The principles guide the performance and activities of anyone involved in the practice of financial planning. The concept and intent of these principles are adapted and enforced on CFP professionals by FPSB members through territory-specific rules of professional conduct. The eight principles or codes of ethics are, client first, integrity, objectivity, fairness, professionalism, 
competence, confidentiality, and diligence. Adhering to these codes of ethics, a CFP is a thorough professional in the subject of personal financial management, which is more than enough reason to consult for advice relating to money matters. After all that has been said, let us understand one more time in a different aspect why must one plan their personal finances. There are three compelling reasons for having a financial plan. In the absence of these three, there is no need to go through such an elaborate, comprehensive, and complicated process to achieve financial needs and goals. Let us see what the three reasons are, and understand how significant they are in the process of financial planning. The first one is uncertainty. Everyone agrees that life is uncertain and everything about life is uncertain. Money matters are no exception. After all, financial matters and life are not independent of each other. In different contexts, uncertainty has different meanings. However, in the present, we are concerned with the unexpected or unforeseen happenings in life that can create or escalate financial burden. One cannot be sure about life. Let us take some examples. Early death is as much a possibility for a road-crossing pedestrian, as it is for a motoring youth. There is no guarantee that an employee will not be laid off the next day. In a country like India plagued by caste-based reservations, a student may lose the chance to get a free seat into a university and be forced to pay a hefty fee or donation for admission, to a private institution. One may have to suddenly travel to a different place to attend to personal, and pressing matters. Or, a friend who has always been our savior may suddenly come running for help. The list of probable uncertainties in life is limitless. Unarguably thus, uncertainty is one of the three fundamental reasons to have a thorough financial plan in place. The second of the three reasons is inflation. Inflation simply means general rise in price levels. For example, in the late 80s and early 90s, a liter of milk used to cost 4 rupees. Today, in the year 2020, a liter of good quality milk costs 50 rupees. To put it another way, 40 years back, monthly household expenses of a family used to be 200 rupees. Now they are 20,000, that is inflation for the common man. While some argue that incomes also increase alongside expenses, it is an undeniable fact that incomes of salaried employees who form the majority of the earning population do not increase at par or close to the inflation rate in the medium to long term. To understand why inflation is a key factor in determining that financial planning is a necessity, let us take one more example. A person is aged 30. He will work until he is 60, when he will retire. He will live for another 30 years, that is, until 90. Imagine there is no inflation. And, in the absence of inflation, there is no growth in income either. He is earning 30 grand now but his expenses are only 15,000. He saves the rest for his future. He does this for the remainder of his earning phase, that is, until 60. By then, he will have accumulated a corpus that will last for 30 years, until he is 90. Is there any kind of elaborate planning required in such a case? Are not simple savings sufficient to meet a financial need? Is it not evident from these examples that in the absence of inflation, comprehensive and thorough financial planning may not be necessary? Note that lifestyle inflation, must not be ignored in the midst of all this, if you know what it means. The final of the three reasons that compel us to have a financial plan is, longevity. Yes. While sudden death is an uncertainty that can be catastrophic for families, sentimentally and financially, longevity or long life or living too long is equally important to plan. Imagine someone planning to live until the age of 90 and creating a corpus of 1 million but dies at the age of 60, leaving a million for his family. What do you think will the financial impact be on the family? Now, imagine the reverse. A person wishes not to live beyond 60 and plans for his expenses only till that age, or does not plan at all for, he works till 60 only. But he survives till 90. Now, who will bear all the expenses of this man for the next 30 years? Love and affection of the family members do not bring money or make provision for hefty hospital bills and other old age needs. Do you not agree? I hope you have now understood why and how uncertainty, inflation and longevity are three fundamental reasons to have a financial plan in place without a choice. I suppose you are by not getting to get a hang of what financial planning means. Keep watching this video to understand it well. Let us understand the financial planning process as defined by the Financial Planning Standards Board, FPSB, which is a six-step process. 
The first step is establishing and defining the relationship with the client. For a long time, many students and individuals misunderstood this step as getting to know the client, building a rapport with him or her, and earning the trust of the client. While these are necessary and are qualitative additions to a planner-client professional relationship, this is not what the first step means. Establishing the relationship means, defining the scope of advice and services the financial planner proposes to provide, depending on the need of the client. This involves having a letter of establishment mutually agreed upon by the client and the CFP. Additionally, it may include information pertaining to the fee chargeable by the professional and a non-disclosure agreement signed by the financial planner, and terms and conditions to be accepted by the client and so on. These documents establish the relationship meaning, they clearly define what a CFP is offering the client, and what a client will get for the fee he pays the CFP. In case of any dispute or misunderstanding, these documents mutually agreed upon, will serve as, proofs and for reference. The second step in the process is, collecting the client's information. Once the planner and the client come to an agreement, the CFP collects necessary data from the client for preparing the financial plan. This data ranges from the financial needs and goals, to the cash inflows and outflows, to assets and liabilities of the individual client or the family. Once the data is sufficiently collected, in the third step, the financial planner analyzes and assesses the client's financial status. That means, the CFP evaluates the budget of the client and sees if there is a surplus or deficit, whether the net worth is positive or negative, how inflation and expected rate of return impact the financial needs and goals etc. If the cash flow is suppose, negative, the financial planner may discuss with the client and see if any unwanted expenses can be cut down to accommodate the needs and goals. Also, depending on the current provisions made or not made to the financial needs and goals, if the CFP finds that one or more needs will not be achieved, corrections to the goals by adjusting the period or the cost of the goal etc. is suggested. After the initial analysis and further discussions with the client, in the fourth step of the process which is developing the financial plan recommendations and present them to the client, the CFP prepares a financial plan and submits an action plan to the client. While the plan is detailed, the action plan is a crisp, summary of what the elaborate financial plan advises. It may contain details of any existing financial products to be surrendered or redeemed, additional financial products that may have to be purchased, asset set allocation to be maintained, diversification to be done within each asset class, mode of investment, that is, whether to make a one-time investment or fixed, recurring, periodic investments, and various strategies to implement to make the goal achievable with the means of the cash flows and net worth of the client, etc. In the fifth step of the process implementing the client's financial planning recommendations, the client, either with the help of the CFP or independently implements the action plan. I say this because, often clients, in spite of paying a fee, fear that the CFP may be biased and recommends buying only such financial products that may generate high commissions. Regardless, whether independently or through the CFP, it is imperative that the action plan is implemented at the earliest. It is the general experience of planners at large that clients, if left to themselves, seldom implement the recommendations, immediately after the submission of the plan. One must remember that a plan not implemented immediately may lose its purpose altogether. While practically it may not be crucial to implement all the recommendations with a few days after the submission of the plan, there may be some actions to be implemented such as buying adequate insurance or filling the gap if any. The sixth and the last step in the financial planning process is, reviewing the client's situation. When we say review, there are two types. One is financial plan review. A plan review is done by checking with the client, generally at least once a year, if any major changes that may impact the entire plan. For example, a childbirth, high increment, and change in goals, etc. The second is portfolio review involving changes to investments, portfolio rebalancing, etc. Now that you have begun to get an understanding of what financial planning is, let us take a step back and learn what it is all about. Financial planning is all about needs and goals, which I have already said many times yet in this video. But what are these? Pay attention. Financial needs are those financial obligations or responsibilities in life, in case of which, a family or an individual cannot take any chance. The very word need indicates that it is crucial. In the absence of proper planning or making adequate provisions for the needs, life financially may become difficult and eventually might affect the happiness, or lifestyle, or other aspects of life. Some financial needs are insurance, education, old age income, and upskilling. 
On the contrary, financial goals are comparable to the contents of a wish list. The examples can include buying a house, buying an expensive bike or a car, going on a holiday on a cruise, wedding, and so on. Be it needs or goals, it is very important to prioritize them, so that, if while analyzing the client's data it is observed by the planner that one or more goals cannot be accommodated into the plan, modifications can be made, or a low-priority goal can altogether be eliminated to serve the larger purpose, which is achieving financial needs. If one or more low-priority financial goals are eliminated, it may not affect the life of an individual or a family. But, if even one financial need is not planned for adequately, the financial life may be severely affected, eventually leading to stress or other disturbances in life. While we understood the six steps of the entire financial planning process as defined by FPSB, let us see what only the planning part constitutes. While financial planning starts with budgeting and cash flow analysis, it is equally true that the purpose of budgeting and everything else is to achieve financial needs and goals. So, in what order are various activities done in the financial planning process? Well, it goes like this. Step 1. All foreseeable, reasonable and practically possible financial needs and goals must be identified. Step 2. All such needs and goals must be separately prioritized. Step 3. After prioritization, the needs and goals must be quantified. That means, estimating the cost of the need or goal in the present monetary terms, without considering inflation. Step 4. All existing financial products and assets must be apportioned or allocated to the prioritized and quantified needs and goals, by carefully matching them based on the goal period with the maturity of the financial product and priority. Step 5. Future cost or value of all quantified needs and goals must be projected based on their respective inflation rates, and after adjusting the provisions made, any shortfall or gap between the corpus required to be accumulated and the current provisions must be planned for, by making one-time or periodic investments or both, that too, depending on the investment risk profile of the investor or client. Now that you are aware of what financial planning is, let us address that one pestering question generally posed by a majority of clients and families. Who is financial planning for? Who needs financial planning or such an advice? Is it for the well-off? Or, is it for the poor? Or, is it for the middle class? The poor feel that they do not have money in, and they do not need any financial planning. Agreed. But, do they want to remain poor for the rest of their lives and generations to come? Their answer to that questions will be an absolute, no. So, is it for the rich? Even the rich need financial planning but it is not that only they need financial planning. In fact, for the high net worth individuals who can keep millions of bucks idly in bank accounts without that having any impact on their needs, it is very much necessary. A majority of any class always are less organized. Be it their feeling of knowing everything while they do not, their pride in listening to or agreeing with a professional, being successful and well off in their own line of work, or simply, lack of time, the rich also need financial planning. However, their need may be different from people of other economic classes. Sometimes, the wealthy may need more of investment planning or portfolio management than a comprehensive financial plan. As a general perception, it can be said that the middle class, in comparison to the rich and the destitute, need the help of a financial planner more. In their constant struggle to improve their lifestyles, middle-class families are generally found to get into debt traps early in their careers, in the form of credit cards, vehicle loans, personal loans and housing loans etc. When they make investments, they go with options such as chip funds, which are neither contemporary nor competent in terms of risk and return, to achieve financial needs and goals. While they strive to make the best of their hard-earned money, middle-class families always, as observed in the present world, are reluctant to pay a fee and employ a professional. Rather, they choose to act on their own misconceptions and learning or replicate the actions of their friends or relatives or colleagues, seldom taking personalized advice from professionals. One way or the other, be it the poor or the rich or the middle class, everyone needs financial planning regardless of age, gender, religion, economic class and geography. I only hope people come to their senses fast and as much as they are attracted to the Western ways, lifestyle, and fashion, adopt the former's organized and systematic methods for a better living. The advice of a CFP in personal money management is as important as it is of a doctor in medicine, or a lawyer in judicial matters, or an engineer in construction. 
Sometimes, after listening to an elaborate explanation like this from a financial planner or reading from the internet, a question arises in the mind of an individual. Can I plan my finances myself? Why do I need a financial planner, a CFP? Why should I spend money if I can Google the stuff, use some calculators available online for free, and do the planning on my own? Sure, one can do that. I mean, one can do financial planning on their own not by reading something online or by using some free calculators, but if they are already knowledgeable enough, understand the process, has experience, and understand the nuances of personal financial management. Also, one can do it on their own if one has alongside the necessary knowledge, has adequate time to do the work and keep a track of the progress of their financial plan and any actions they take. Even if one has enough time and knowledge to plan oneself, it always pays to get a second opinion from a professional, to be sure if they are on the right track or if any modifications or improvements can be done in the plane to better the probability of achieving the goals and securing one's financial future. Not only that. Financial planners use a lot of technical tools and resources to carefully craft a financial plan. Common people who are not professionals are unaware of such tools or such tools may prove too complicated to use or too expensive for an individual to buy to plan for the needs and goals, for a single use. Merely because one knows that one has to take aspirin or paracetamol for a headache does not make one as efficient as a doctor. Similarly, merely because one knows how to read a business newspaper or understand what is debated on a business news channel or make an investment in mutual funds does not make one an expert of financial management or successful in achieving financial needs and goals. The need for a CFP can never be ruled out in personal financial management. After all this struggle to make an individual understand the importance of personal financial management and the need to hire a CFP, one final question naturally arises in the mind of the individual. What is the fee for financial planning? How much does a financial planner or a CFP charge? Well, when I researched on the internet, I found that in the US, an hourly fee ranging from 180 to 240 US dollars is charged. Instead of an hourly fee, if a one-time fee is chargeable it can range from $2,000 to $2,500. But, that is in the US, which is a developed market for financial planning profession. In India, the fee for financial planning is in line with the income earned there. An hourly fee of $200 converts into 15,000 Indian rupees, which is the monthly budget for a majority of families. If the total fee is 15,000, people may find it affordable. But if it is an hourly fee and the total fee runs into hundreds of thousands, people rather find unsolicited and free advice more favorable regardless of the probable losses they suffer from uninformed decisions and poor and biased advices of salespersons. In India, financial planners charge anything from zero to 25 grand. And, that may not always include investment or portfolio management recurring fee. Generally, those who charge zero or a nominal fee do so with the intention of selling financial products to the client in the name of implementation of the action plan. While some genuinely do recommend suitable financial products that match clients' needs, it is always not so. There is a decade-long history of share brokers and financial product distributors providing free financial planning to eventually sell various financial products, most of the time is sold. Those who charge a fee do so after taking into account the number of goals, time the plan consumes, their hourly rate, length of the plan, and financial position of the client, etc. and tailor the fee to client. Again, it is not the case with all. Most financial planners may charge a standard or a flat fee or all clients up to a certain income level. When the financial plan also involves active portfolio management, there may be an additional fee as a percentage of the value of the portfolio. I am SNJK Wenkutasam, popularly known as SNJKV. I am a certified financial planner. I have been associated with the profession since 2005. I am the author of the book Roots of Financial Freedom, a timeless financial planning guide for the CFP, working professionals, students of financial planning, the retired, women and everyone else, who are interested in understanding the practical aspects of financial planning. You can reach me by searching Google for SNJKV. You can reach me on my Facebook page SNJKV Financial Planning, or find me on Twitter as SNJKV, or visit my YouTube channel Salt Academy with the CFP logo, or best, visit my website snjkv.in. You may order my book Roots of Financial Freedom from Amazon. May God bless you with great health, wealth, patience, compassion, gratitude for what you have and contentment. See you soon. Take care.